Good evening, everyone. This well, will be as soon as we officially start the meeting of the Newburyport Historical Commission. We're just going to allow uh, another minute or so for both attendees and uh, one additional commissioner to, to join. So just be with us for a few moments while we do that and we'll be joining, uh, we'll be officially starting uh, shortly. And good, I see Malcolm has joined. Um, very good. So I think everyone is here. Okay, so why don't we get started? We have a pretty full agenda. So uh, this is the meeting of the 20, oh, I still have uh, October 14th, Newburyport Historical Commission. Getting a bit of an echo, so if anyone is not uh, needing to speak, if you can temporarily mute yourself, that might help. I'll start with a roll call of the commissioners attending uh, in alphabetical order. Um, Mr. Malcolm Carnwath. Here. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, Mark Sendrone. Present. Okay, Mr. Christopher Fay. Here. Okay, Peter McNamee. Here. Very good. Uh, Joe Morgan. Yes, here. Thank you, Joe. And the Vice Chair Patricia Pecknick is absent tonight. Uh, this is the Chair Glenn Richards also present. Uh, also present, we have Caitlin Sullivan, City Planner, and um, Gretchen Joy taking notes. There may or may not be a public comment period tonight, so for the second time, I'll review the rules for those if and when that uh, time should come. But if you are an attendee or speaker, if you happen to be on the phone, um, it's star nine to raise a hand and star six to unmute, um, and we will unmute your uh, audio uh, as appropriate uh, when the time comes so that uh, the applicant or their attorneys or who is representing them may be heard. So we'll move right into the agenda. Uh, we have one demolition delay application for 50 Boardman Street. I believe attorney Lisa Mead will be speaking on behalf of the applicant who wishes to remove an exist existing accessory structure, commonly known as a garage in this case, and construct one in the same footprint, but taller. Um, so uh, I'll let you enable your audio uh, in a moment, uh, um, Ms. Mead. Uh, but uh, I just want you to, to also know, I, I decided to, to keep things clear on this. I think it, since that first vote on um, historically significant and preferably preserved or not is sort of a three-way decision, I'm going to split that into two votes. So we'll first take a vote strictly on historical significance or not. And then uh, depending on the outcome of that vote, we can then decide uh, if it is historically significant, we can make a, the decision as to whether it's pres uh, preferably preserved or not. And of course, um, if, it, if it is, then we'll move to the demolition plan review. If not, we don't need to. So we just wanted you to be aware of that as it might you know, affect what you wanna say, but I'm sure um, uh, you'll have, I think you've, Based on what I saw in your presentation, you have a lot of information about historical, historical significance and so on. So why don't you uh, say, is, is your audio enabled? I believe it is. So you can go ahead, uh, Attorney Mead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and for the record, Lisa Mead, uh, Mead Teller Mikasa, 30 Green Street in New Report on behalf of Bruce Atkins and Gail Casson, who are the owners of this property. If you could go to the first slide, please. So the property is located at 50 Boardman Street, but this is a, um, a garage, small garage, as the chair noted, um, which is set back over 40 feet um, from Washington Street. So the front of the house is actually Boardman. This is to the back of the house, but set off of Washington Street because the property is on the corner of Washington Boardman, which we'll show you momentarily. So the request is to remove the structure and replace it with a new structure, as was stated earlier. Uh, no work is proposed on the single family home. Um, the garage first appears on, on the documents that we have on the 1924 assessor's map, but not on the 1914 Sanborn map. So it is not clear whether or not it's 100 years old or not. So as the board is aware, if it were not 100 years old, it wouldn't come under the jurisdiction of the board. I think that um, Jennifer is making sure that the board has a review of this, even though it's unclear and we certainly can't prove whether or not uh, it is uh, 100 years old. So it's not listed in the district data sheets. Um, and as you will see shortly in the photos I'm about to show you, the structure is unsound and cannot be used uh, at full functionality at all, um, either as a shed, a garage, uh, or in any manner as an accessory structure. And in fact, uh, my clients have informed me that they basically store nothing in there 
um, particularly anything that would, they would be fearful of losing. Um, and as we'll talk about in a minute, if we have to, the design of the new uh, garage is simple, appropriate, um, and appropriate for the site uh, and matches the house. So the next slide, please. So here you see the 1914 Sanborn map. The arrow shows where this property is at the corner of Boardman uh, and Washington Street. It's currently a gray uh, colored uh, structure if you were to drive down there, which I actually did today having come from High Street. Um, but there's no shed uh, or accessory structure or garage located on the lot at this time. Next structure, next slide, please. On this one, it's a, it's a little smaller. I don't know if you can uh, zoom in on that or not, but you can see the uh, there is a garage or shed now on the 1924 uh, a map, assessor's map. And that is in the same you know, location to the extent that they're accurate um, as the current existing shed, shed. So this is 1924. Next slide, please. And as you can see on this site plan, uh, again, if you could just blow it up a little bit, um, Caitlin, um, the garage sits at the back corner on the left-hand side of the lot, uh, about 40 some odd feet off of Washington Street. Um, you really can't see it um, off of Boardman Street at all. And you certainly have to be standing right in front of the driveway in order to see it on Washington Street. Next slide, please. So here is the existing elevations um, of the structure. Um, very simple garage. Next slide, please. And um, we can skip this. These are the proposed elevations. I think the chair wants to have this discussion later. And so here are some sh photographs um, of the context. So you can see the garage in the back. As I noted, it sits behind the house off of Washington Street. Next slide, please. And here's a head on view of the structure at the end of the drive. Next slide, please. So our clients bought this property in 2002. This is essentially the garage uh, in 2002. Um, I am told um, that uh, prior to them purchasing this, the former owners attempted to straighten it out by uh, trying to lift it with chains and a crane at which time it almost fell down uh, and they had to jerry-rig it with um, chains and a cross piece, which we'll show you in a minute, um, inside to prevent it from falling down. Um, so that, it, and so what my clients have done over the last uh, 19 years is attempt to keep it up, um, to keep it looking good for the property to the extent they can, but really um, it is beyond that. So next slide, please. Pardon the interruption, Attorney Mead. Was there any sure. significance to the, the black lines that were in that last? Uh... I think it's just to show that it, uh, those were on the photo. So we didn't add those, but I oh. think it's right there. Um, just so you, the board knows, um, early in lit, the late 1990s, uh, the prior owners had received uh, a variance to put a larger, I think that's what this is from, to put a larger uh -huh. garage in this location, that would have been prior to the board, uh, the commission existing for the purposes of demolition delay. Mm -hmm. So I okay. think that that was the larger garage that was proposed there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's a close up look at it. Um, you, you know, they've tried to straighten it out on the inside. We'll show you what they've used to do that. They put new doors on it. Obviously, they've painted it, um, but it's it's not in great shape. Next slide, please. And here you go. So we start our um, jerry riggering by adding some braces in the corners. Next slide. And nothing is plumb. You'll see that on some of these slides. Uh, the floor is concrete. It's got a crack in it, but you see it's poured concrete floor. It's probably later added. I don't know that for a fact. Next slide. Um, this is a, just a level to show that um, they've tried to straighten it out somewhat from the photo you saw from 2002, but it, it's not, it's certainly not plumb. Next slide, please. And this is just the side of it, and you can see they've, they've tried to make it 
so that you can see the door jam that doesn't close on the edge there. This is the side of the garage. Next slide. And so inside, um, they, there's the cross beams that you can see that were added to help try to hold it together. They've used this um, rope um, to try to hold that beam up and the, and the uh, roof line in place. Next slide, please. And similarly, you can see how they've tried to jerry-rig some stabilization of it uh, to keep, keep it from collapsing. Next slide. Another shot of the front, you can see that the, when the doors are not um, level and don't really actually close well. Next slide. And these are the windows in the back. Obviously, they're replacement windows. They're not, certainly not original windows. You can see the base of the of the garage here. The, the uh, I can't think of the, the name of the lumber at the bottom um, is is all um, is all crumbling and um, falling apart. Next slide. Again, another shot of the barn not being or garage not being square or plumb. And next slide more of the inside with the beams that were put in to help try to stabilize it. And next slide. And just a different shot of the same thing. You'll see the wire to the left of that one beam that was dropped down that was put in by the prior owners to help try to um, keep it from collapsing. Next slide. That might be it. So, so with that, um, before we do anything else, I guess um, we believe that the the barn is not historically the garage is not historically significant, and even if it were historically civic, significant, certainly is not um, preferably preserved. And we'd ask the board to make that determination. Okay, thank you, Attorney Mead. Uh, uh, is, does anyone on uh, any of my co-panelists here have a question for uh, the applicant or Attorney Mead? Let's see. Let's see speaking. All right. So I think you understand uh, the, the first uh, vote here is uh, unless someone has a comment or uh, 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 to, I'd like to make a discussion, the chair is perfectly willing to hear a motion to that the, since motions are phrased in a positive, we, the motion would be that the structure is historically significant. So if you don't think it is, you would simply uh, vote no. Is there, do I hear such a motion? So moved. Mark Sandron. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, is there a second? Second that is Peter. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I'll go around the group here. Uh, Malcolm Conrath? No. All right, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, Mark Sandron? Nope. Okay, thank you. Christopher Fay? Do we, can you see if you can get your audio going, Chris, I'll skip you over you for the moment. Uh, Peter yeah, McAmey. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, can now hear we me? hear you. Okay. You vote on that? Um, I would vote no. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter McNamee? No. Okay, thank you, Peter. Joe Morgan? No. Okay, thank you. And uh, the chair will agree with the, the others. Um, so what this means, uh, well, I know, I'm sure you, Attorney Mead, know what it means, but for, the, for those uh, also listening in, uh, the, since it is not historically significant, um, you may, the applicant may proceed with uh, their plans. And um, you're welcome to add any quick comments if you like, or you can simply uh, agree to uh, that we'll just move on to the next um, item. No, uh, thank you very much. No, we appreciate the board's time and we will move on to the zoning board. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, don't go too far, uh, Attorney Mead, because I, yeah, uh, you, you <laughs> I think you're going to be, uh, you also represent uh, the, rep the applicant at 22-24 Olive Street, which is the next on the agenda. Yes, sir. So, uh, just in, this is a slightly different hearing. This is a review of amended demolition plans. Uh, at an earlier meeting, the structure was found to be both historically significant and preferably preserved. It's been uh, uh, already 
uh, it was an, after that initial review, there were some changes that were also reviewed uh, with just a couple additional points. So Attorney Mead, why don't I uh, let you speak to what the applicant has done to address uh, those most recent comments uh, from the board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and we'll just dive right into it. Tonight with me is um, John Sarkis, the manager and owner of 2224 Ellis Street LLC, and Ernie DeMaia, who is the architect on the project who you've heard from before. So as the chair said, um, we have um, actually addressed, uh, we hope, the uh, issues that were raised by the board at the last meeting, uh, very specifically. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So, um, Essentially, and we're, I'm going to show you these slides in a minute and have Ernie go over them, but on the south elevation, there had been a bay window proposed on Russia Street. Uh, the board has some comments related to that. Uh, that's been replaced with a single double hung window uh, matching the other windows on Russia Street. On the west elevation or the end, if you're coming east on Russia Street, um, there was a chimney um, that um, hadn't yet been completely fought, fought through um, as compared to the uses of the, of the various floors. And there has been some discussion about that uh, from the board. Uh, the applicant has uh, finalized that. The chimney was shortened in height. Uh, it was proportionally uh, made proportionally more slender. The windows were moved laterally to align from the floor to floor and the windows were shifted away from underneath the chimney to visually stack the mass of the brick chimney over the brick facade. And so with that, um, what I thought I would do um, is turn it over to Ernie. And if you go to the first slide, please, Caitlin, I'll note that again, not on this slide, but as you go through the slides, um, the applicant has uh, noted all of the materials on the plans again, uh, noted the improvements that are going to be made to the original structure, uh, you know, the removal of the plastic shutters, things of that nature, the improvements, the side lights and things like that. Um, so those are all back onto these plans. So there's no question about the details that will be incorporated. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ernie uh, to review the actual elevations. Thank you, Lisa. Ernie DeMeo from Tectonics Architects here. Um, I, uh, I see my picture and I don't know how I get my face on there, but uh, <laughs> um, in any case, um, uh, all right. Um, so uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, we replaced the bay window that uh, existed on the first floor in the recess uh, along Russia Street uh, with a window that was matching the other windows ab above and alongside so that uh, the entire facade now is treated uh, in a similar way with the windows. Um, we did some significant reconfiguring on the interior of the structure to allow us a little more flexibility for the location of windows along the west facade, uh, which we've now been able to align um, both from floor to floor and also horizontally um, so that facade, that west facade, which is very important. It's set back very far from the property line and as such is uh, visually prominent along Russia Street. Um, we've um, ordered, made a more orderly facade there. Uh, we've also, as Lisa mentioned, uh, reduced the height of that chimney and made it proportionally more slender and stacked it over the brick um, facade below it so as to uh, give it a more resolved um, appearance uh, along that facade. Um, that was um, uh, a, a comment from several of the uh, board members in our last meeting, and I think we've addressed that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just quick contortion, just so we're all clear. The yeah. What we're calling the south, okay, I think this answers my question. So the south elevation is the one that actually is along Russia Street. The west elevation is the one that on that previous uh, slide was kind of in shadow with the, the chimney and the four windows there, correct? Correct. correct. Okay, thanks. Yes. So um, here you can see uh, the top drawing is the south elevation and the window at the lower left-hand corner of that elevation is where the bay window uh, once resided and has now been replaced by uh, a double-hung window that's compatible with the rest of the windows on that facade. 
Um, the elevation below is the Olive Street elevation of the building, which uh, is the existing building. And um, from a architectural point of view, unchanged other than materials uh, that we're replacing in kind. Uh, next slide, please. And the, the final drawing, the upper drawing represents the north elevation and the lower drawing represents the west elevation. The west elevation being the one that we've reworked substantially based on the previous comments. We've repositioned the windows. We've um, uh, kept the, wind, uh, the uh, chimney centered on the um, ridge line of the addition, but we've moved windows around such that the massing of the chimney and the facade makes more sense visually. And uh, uh, as I've said, we've aligned the windows um, both from side to side and from floor to floor. So we think in those ways, we've addressed the majority of the comments that were made in the last meeting that uh, uh, we were asked to uh, give more study. I did want to speak briefly to the north elevation, which is above. Uh, early in the planning stages for this building, given the footprints that we were asked to design um, the structure, we had to make some decisions about facades that were considered in our minds uh, major facades and facades that were perhaps considered more minor facades. Um, treating facades differently depending on where they, uh, what position they occupy on the site uh, has many historic precedents as common in historic buildings. We chose to put living spaces and sleeping spaces along uh, the primary facades, which um, are obviously for the addition along Russia Street and along the west facade. They're very prominent from the street. They're viewed from many angles in the neighborhood. The north facade, in all honesty, uh, is viewed. Um, there's a sliver of view corridor along Olive Street uh, where you can see the very far west end of the addition from a distant view. So the French doors and the uh, overhanging roof can be seen from Olive Street, but most of the body of the building uh, cannot be seen. Most of the body of the addition cannot be seen from Olive Street because of the setbacks of the addition. Um, also, we, we placed most of the, what you might consider to be the servant spaces for the building, bathrooms and kitchens, along the north facade because they had much less requirement for natural light and view whereas the living spaces and the more civic-minded spaces uh, face towards uh, Russia Street. The north facade gets no sun, and uh, the smaller window treatment for those servant spaces seems to make appropriate sense to us. And as such, we have not altered the north facade from what you saw previously because we believe this is the correct expression for the building as it is. Um, and. Um, I think that summarizes where we've come from since the last meeting. Thank so thank you, Ernie. Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, um, we're happy to take any questions and uh, we hope that um, we've addressed all the prior issues of the, mm -hmm. of the commission. Okay, thank you, Attorney Mead. I, I just have one real quick one. Uh, looking at this slide we, that's in front of us right now, in the lower section, the west elevation, the new chimney looks significantly lower in height than the uh, existing chimneys, but in the west, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, sorry, the north. north, yeah, that north elevation, it no, wait a minute. The north elevation. Oh, God. <laughs> the north okay, elevation is the top elevation, Mr. Chair, and the west okay. elevation is the lower one. All right. It, 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 what, what threw me off was where the, it says north elevation is in, yeah. is, is in the air. All right, you get it. Anyway, the upper part, it looks almost the same height as existing. So I'm wondering uh, which is the more accurate depiction of the height of that new chimney. I think that's an optical illusion, but I'll let um, I'll let Ernie um, address that. I agree with Lisa. Um, I think the better vantage point is actually the, the drawing prior. Um, you might be able to see that a little more clearly. The drawing prior, um, it's it, uh, it's hard to project the eye across, but the um, if if you were to measure the height of the chimney across the page, the um, the top of the chimney is clearly much lower in the 
in the addition than it is in the they used to all be at the same height and mm -hmm. that's been dropped down lower. Um, mm -hmm. I think the perspective also shows it fairly clearly. Um, the uh, intention is to have that chimney be uh, proportionally thinner and shorter. Yes, yeah, it did look that. So is it, is it correct? Is the rendition correct on the east elevation, the Olive Street side? You wouldn't even see it? Um, I would say in a straight on elevation, you might see the top of the chimney if you were uh, if you were a drone uh, hovering uh, up at the roof elevation, you might see a peak of the chimney beyond. You will certainly not see it from the street. Yeah, got it. Okay, well, let me uh, turn to my uh, fellow commissioners uh, to start off with. Does anyone have a question for either the architect or the attorney Mead? Any, anything like to clarify? Uh, Joe, I see a hand go up. I have one question, thank you. As concerning the original structure, um, there's a, an existing wood frame shed along the west side of that structure. And it seems to me when we made the site visit that maybe it was John or others who mentioned that uh, there had been some modification to the exterior masonry wall. Is, that, is, is the plan to restore that to its original condition? Yes, so the, the exposed, thank you, Mr. Morgan, and um, Ernie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the new exposed um, wall or to be exposed wall and then the, the wall that was exposed that needs to be corrected uh, will be restored. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, in, just... fact, in fact, if we might, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, we might go back for a second to the um, perspective view. Um, you can see the what is the west wall of the existing building. There are two windows shown in the return wall before you get to the uh, connector entry. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, the uh, the lower one is a window that is currently buried in a wall behind the existing one-story um, wood frame structure that's there now that will be removed. So we're actually restoring that that window and we're saving the window that is uh, up above. So um, our intention is to expose as much of that original wall from that facade and restore as many windows as we can. So. Okay, that's great. Are you going to repaint the building? Yes, we. Um, the building has been painted several times and uh, we studied with um, the owner of the project uh, different possibilities for treatment, and it was determined that the one that uh, is um, the the option that will leave us with the uh, the best appearance, the best finish for the building, is to in fact repaint the building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Ernie. And, and uh, just a quick comment for me. Um, you know where you have um, so. How should I put it? You've very um, much emulated the style of the original building, uh, but you have differentiated it with both the connector, the size and massing and so on. So I think having that different color treatment actually is helpful to differentiate the two, uh, you know, the old and the new as well. So um, for, I think that's yet another, you know, good reason to, uh, to use that same treatment. Any other commissioners have a, Mark Sandrone, I see your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, my recollection is that there was some discussion about the square footage of the new structure, and there was no, um, to my recollection, uh, definite answer on to whether or not that had changed or what the exact square footage was. Could you could you enlighten me on this, please? Um, so I, I think that we said last time, uh, Mr. Sendrone, that the Net amount of floor area being added um, was reduced from our original proposal of 1758 to 1,511 square feet. So that's the net amount that's being added. Um, you're looking for the square footage of the new addition specifically? Yes. So the, uh, hang on a second. So the, 
Hang on a second, because I have this. Ernie gave it to me. The proposed first floor area of the uh, addition, including the mudroom, is uh, 900 square feet. Is that right, Ernie? I'm looking at your numbers, and I want to make sure that's right. Yes, the, the um, first floor of the addition, including the mudroom, is 900 square feet. Um, the first floor of the existing building, including the mudroom that's partially in the new addition, is 1620. So there's 2520 on the first floor. So the entire. Of the entire, of the entire. Um, on the second floor, we have 1,008 square feet for the addition, which is um, entirely one unit, uh, occupies the entire uh, second floor of the addition. And the existing building has 1,512 square feet in the existing building only for a total of 2,520 on the second floor. Uh, for a grand total of 5,040 square feet for the entire project. Thank you. Um, Mark, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, uh, um, Commissioner McNamee, McNamee, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I just have two questions and I apologize if we're covering old ground, um, but I don't recall the note um, on the east facade uh, regarding the entry and the side lights uh, to restore existing wood and side lights. And whatnot. Um, can, can you describe the restoration that will happen there? You know, what, 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 what will that restoration entail? Well, um, I, I believe the, um, owner of the project might speak best to this, but our intention has always been to um, maintain the existing materials, to uh, remove any layers of paint that have been added in recent years, uh, to obviously sand and repair any damage to the existing um, material and to repaint it. Uh, that uh, we uh, are not going to replace uh, any panels or any glazing unless uh, there's any uh, damage to any of those pieces, which we have not observed to this point. So. Okay, so materials and, and details will be, will be maintained. Yes. Great. My other question is regarding the, uh, the gutters and downspouts, which are listed as, um, as either copper or copper-toned aluminum. Um, is there a reason we don't just land on copper? Um, I think this is um, a decision that uh, I think we've we've all leaned towards copper. Uh, where, as the project develops further and as we develop the details further, that is uh, where we would prefer to steer the project. I think there are many alternatives to copper that give the appearance of copper uh, that uh, might be, uh, from a budget standpoint, uh, viable, viable alternatives, but copper right. is something that we, we, we would prefer to do. Um, Ernie, I'm going to interrupt you and because you've been talking and I've exchanged uh, texts with John. Um, yep. he'll, agree to, he'll agree to do copper. Sure. Thank you. That's that, those are my only questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, any any uh, we haven't heard from um, Chris. Any any thoughts or comments uh, before we uh, you know does it? Um, I think that we could you know consider you know, a motion at this point, or if anyone has any thoughts on whether this uh, is ready to be, whether it's ready for decision on approval or not? I think I missed the last when this was, this is the third time we've talked about this. So I think I missed the last one. So um, I tried to go back to, I know we talked about this in the mm -hmm. summertime. It just, um, 
<laughs> yeah, and well, it's, I feel like it's just it's. The, I think my impression last time was it's just it's too big for the area, but you know, it's a small little street. Russia Street is really what we're talking about here. So that would be my only thought. I don't know what you know the overall size, what it was was reduced from to this particular point. Um, okay. I know that I wasn't here last time, so I don't know if I'm eligible to vote or not. <laughs> uh, technically, I think you are, but uh, so let me just go. I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Malcolm. Um, could you put the, the uh, north side elevation back up? The Merrimack Street side again? I just wondered why the uh, the windows on the addition, the back part, are asymmetrical. I mean, this is an architectural period where symmetry is everything. And I was wondering what, uh, like the windows don't seem to line up the one on the bottom left. Um, I just uh, was curious. So, um, if I could through you, Mr. Chair, and then if I don't answer properly, I'll let Ernie do it again. So, um, Mr. Carnworth, um, the um, uh, earlier the architect um, talked about this being the non-public uh, side, if you will, of the building and the uh, the more workings of the addition are in the back, uh, not actually unusual for the um, active part of the building, the street facing side, the public facing to side to have the more symmetrical windows. And so they've put the kitchen and the bathrooms and things like that in the back, uh, which call for different size windows. Uh, and so um, that's, that's essentially why they have done that um, because it's not really visible from the street and allows them to make those portions of the addition uh, more working focused. And Ernie, if I misspoke at all, please correct me. Yeah, well, no, I, I don't think you misspoke, but I will also add that um, um, when one considers the existing building, for example, um, the existing building has what you might consider to be symmetrical window mm -hmm. organization along the Merrimack side. It has symmetrical organization along Olive Street and along Russia Street. But the facade that uh, has the one-story piece right now, which might be considered uh, the rear elevation of that house, does not, in fact, have symmetrical window locations. It's not shown on these drawings because we're covering it up with, um, with the addition in these drawings. Earlier drawings did show to you the fact that the window arrangement was um, much less organized than, than these uh, than the remaining facades. And I would also add that the existing building has a luxury that we don't have. The existing building is about 38% larger in terms of floor area than what we're proposing to build here. And so there is much more freedom of uh, organization on the inside of the building to put uh, more of the servant type uses towards the core of the building and allow the facade to be much more fenestrated than we do because our footprint is uh, somewhat limited compared to the existing building. We chose to put the, the, the spaces that required the most light and the more civic look uh, to be the, the more visible facades. And, and the north facade is differentiated from them because that is somewhat uh, typical for um, buildings that are uh, of a historic nature. They have primary facades and they have secondary facades and not all secondary facades are treated the way the primary facades are treated. Yeah. Yeah, and they also had the luxury back then. They didn't have uh, kitchen counters that, that we universally have nowadays. But yeah, Malcolm, uh, this is just my additional comment that you can see in the lower part of what we're looking at right now, how that part you're I'll th talk referring to how that is set back directly behind the uh, the, uh, original, the existing building. So I think I, I understand that the thinking there around, you know, it's 
the, the much lower visibility so that um, as the architect and, and also attorney media was saying that uh, that was kind of the place where they could take advantage of that low visibility to to um, kind of accommodate more contemporary interior requirements is how I guess how I would put it. I would I would also add that the um, and it was prevalent in an earlier view from an earlier uh, meeting, I think our last meeting, that when standing on Olive Street, uh, the French doors and the and the roof above the French doors and the small uh, minor deck coming off the French doors uh, might be visible for a um, a very brief moment along walking along Olive Street, but most of the body of that north elevation, the red brick portion, uh, will not be seen from any vantage point in the public way. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I understand that. I, I uh, we, we, uh, we have some houses in Newburyport where they actually have a space where they, where they can't accommodate a window, but they've actually put in a fake window uh, just to have the symmet symmetry. The, uh, I know the only person who's going to be looking at this side is the neighbor on that side, but, you know, it's just an idea. I just was, uh, you know, I, 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 I personally, uh, uh, don't like don't like asymmetry when it comes to a federal period addition. Even uh, so, that's just my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I would gather then you're not much of a fan of the existing building on the on the west uh, facade. Uh, which which way is the that, that's that's the facade that that's where they're going to put the this proposed addition malcolm where, where it's kind of um unfortunately we don't it's not shown as he explained because the proposed addition is is there instead but there's um a, uh, some asymmetry there today existing because of you know what's been built out and and you know accommodations they've made for i'm not sure what's in there whether it's a kitchen or whatever but yeah, I'm so, just expressing my opinion. That's yeah. all. Okay. Yep. That's fine. That's fine. And uh, did they answer your question though as to why it's like that? Yeah, you know, to accommodate yeah. the interior space, which yeah. and we're we're uh, I I feel like our our uh, what our position is is to consider the exterior space. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I hesitate to say this because I don't want to sound like I'm arguing for the applicant, but uh, I know that there was a, a house we re that recently was put under a preservation restriction, a very wonderful historic house, and, uh, and their, their rear elevation, they had to also have slightly different type um, window heights to accommodate because that's where their kitchen is and so on. Um, so um, I wasn't... Um, hmm. Wasn't planning on taking public comment, but I know there are a number of people uh, attending tonight, and I have a feeling that there are people who want to comment. So um, uh, I will allow brief public comment, please. Oh, uh, if it's you know about um, things that the ZPA will address, such as you know uh, points of view, um, or rather you know setbacks or or lighting and shade and, and, and that sort of thing, that would be the appropriate spot for those. If you'd like to comment on the uh, uh, historical appropriateness or, or lack of it, uh, then that would this would be the time to do that. So since uh, I've opened that up uh, or will be opening it up, the, the, the rules are, you know, we'll do it one at a time. When you are recognized, we will unmute your audio. Um, raise your hand to, so that we know you would like to speak. Uh, so when we, uh, again, recognize you, just unmute yourself on your end and you'll be able to be heard. State your name and address and uh, please uh, try to keep your comments uh, to uh, brief length if possible. So, uh, so Caitlin, I'll just take them kind of in the order that's showing up my list here. It looks like a Carol Zampronia. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Yes, this is Carol Zamprona at 20 Olive Street. I'm the direct abutter to this property. I'm still trying to understand the exact size of both the connector and the new 
building, it sounds like it's over 1900 square feet in total. I wanna make sure that I'm truly understanding that. So that's perhaps a question to attorney Mead and to the developer mm -hmm. and architect. I don't know if you want them to address right. that now or if you want me to continue. Oh, uh, well, it, I, uh, I believe they did discuss the um, the square footage of the addition and a few minutes ago. Um, but why don't we take that, since this isn't a QA and a period, it's public comment, we'll take that. So you were interested in, what is the, is it the square footage of the addition? Yeah, the total square footage of the connector and the new building. They were doing it by floor. I just want to make sure I'm doing my math on right. the total size. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll get an answer for that. Um, um, and if you can look at the slides on the east elevation, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm confused. It's a lovely open space with a big, beautiful tree where I believe my home is. So it's looking much more open than reality, unless I'm somehow looking at the wrong view, but I'm quite confused by that. Okay. The, uh, okay, we can ask if they, uh, the, it sounds like perhaps the rendition, uh, the rendering did not include uh, adjacent properties and so on. It like changes the that. view of the, of the property when others are looking at it. I don't know if they're still doing a metal roof on the connector. I know that was a concern in a prior meeting that one of your colleagues had, and I don't think that's been addressed. So another question. Um, I obviously, I won't go into light and air and sunlight and all those things that aren't the purview of the historical committee. Okay. I know there's other places for that, and it's not your concern. I know your concern, likewise, is not the, any developer's profit margin. Um, <laughs> I did read, Mr. Richards, in your filing earlier this summer that one option is that the applicant make a bona fide reasonable effort to locate a person willing to purchase their lease and to preserve, rehabilitate, or restore the preferably preserved building or structure. Mm -hmm. So I know in this real estate market, that would certainly be an option that the neighborhood uh, and I'll let them speak for themselves, what, but the neighborhood and neighbors, including myself, excuse me, would prefer that it stays as a single family, beautiful historic home in its current two family structure. I also know that the mission of the Newburyport Historical Commission is to protect, preserve, and promote Newburyport's historic structures, neighborhoods, and landscapes. And I just have to tell you, when I look at this plan and these 2,000 square feet addition, it doesn't feel to me like it's preserving the historic structure of the property or the neighborhood. So I still have a number of concerns with the size of this building. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carol. Making some notes here. Um, okay, um, thank you. And uh, Amy Badger. Hi. Hi. It's uh, Amy Badger at 21 Olive Street. And um, I agree with um, a number of the uh, board members that were talking about the aesthetics of this. Yes, they've come back a couple times and the aesthetics have improved. However, um, aren't we still talking about putting a whole new home into a backyard? And I believe that the historical committee, and I know that the, this, probably something for zoning, but the historical committee has a responsibility to this neighborhood, but also to this town, because I think this is a bellwether for other areas of town. We have all sorts of zoning, two family, in-law, apartments. I think we need to put our foot down when we have just a nice little backyard that that becomes a home because it's allowed. So I know this is the historical committee and I'm very appreciative for all of your efforts, but we're, if we're really honest about this, we're not just talking about the aesthetics of it. We're talking about the impact of our neighborhood with some of the most historic t homes in town. So I hope you'll consider that as you go forward. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, next I have Micah Donahue, looks like 16 Olive. Hi, Micah Donahue at 16 Olive Street. I'm two doors down from the property in question. Um, I think that the, the key here for me is the, his, is the historic impact on the neighborhood of replacing uh, a two family, existing two family single structure with what is clearly two buildings. Um, this is, you know, the connector, you know, maybe the, the attempt to solve that. But um, as Amy said, we're putting, you know, another entire home 
uh, on this lot, which seems to change the historic character of, you know, this really significant property, uh, you know, of the uh, historic record that it is, um, you know, of the, you know, what, what an amazing, um, you know, history we heard of the property from the beginning. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. And Ms. Badger, uh, it looks like your hand is still up, so don't forget to put that down. Um, I have Elizabeth Hallett. Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Hallett, 23 Olive Street. Um, we are uh, almost directly across from the uh, east facade. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, agree very much with uh, the points that uh, Carol, Micah, and uh, Amy have brought up, are my neighbors. Um, this home is, as you know, historically significant and not just the, the building, but the lot. Um, being already a two family home, um, it, it um, deserves this lot. And right now this addition, as you keep calling it, um, this addition to the historic house, it actually still, it's still reading as two separate homes. You're building a separate home uh, onto the back of this historic home, regardless of the connector. It, this is how it reads. Um, it's supposed to look like an addition. Um, I was told by Mr. Sarkis when he canvassed the neighbors and tried to explain what he'd like to do. But in fact, um, it just, it, it, the, the connector does nothing for it, does not look like an addition. And it truly is gonna detract from um, the feeling of this historic neighborhood. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you for your comments. And remember to, okay, you did. Um, not seeing any other hands. I'll give a few more seconds to see if uh, I do see one. Uh, looks like Mr. Coulter John has raised a hand. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Tom. Thank you. Um, Tom Coulter John, 64 Federal Street, co president of the Newburyport Preservation Trust. Uh, I'd like to thank the developer and the architect for their efforts in fixing the windows as recommended by the Historic Commission, and also getting rid of that bay window. Uh, that certainly improved it. Uh, having said that, the building is not at all smaller. It still reads as two buildings and not an addition. I agree with Elizabeth Hallett. It needs a significant reduction in size to fit into this neighborhood. Um, I don't think it meets the Secretary of the Interior standards. We, when you look at it sideways from, say, Russia Street, it, it's, you know, the, the connector and the, the addition certainly together look longer than the original building. So I think, I, I think it, it certainly demonstrates that it, it looks and feels visually as though it's two buildings. And uh, I think it should re be reduced in size. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Coulter-Chan. Um, I see a uh, Stephanie Niketish. Stephanie Niketich, 93 High Street. So I, I agree with what uh, Mr. Coulter-John has said and what neighbors have said. And it's actually something that members of the Historic Commission have said in prior meetings, that this, um, this design still reads as uh, two buildings and a, you know, a conjoined mass. And uh, I think that was your last meeting and a, one previous I think commissioners uh, said that it looks like a, you know, something typically you would see in a, a, a non-historical subdivision. Uh, so it's really from a, from a, the context of this neighborhood, which is modest, it is a supersizing of a, of a building and it does look like two houses just joined by a, you know, a connector. 
And if the Historical Commission decides to lift the delay based on these new plans, I really uh, would hope that in your, uh, in your report, um, in that lifting of the delay, that you will record the comments of commissioners who are concerned that this still looks like uh, two buildings. It's the, the connector does not solve the problem of, uh, you know, making it an integral building, uh, which is a requirement under zoning. So I think it would be very helpful if, um, if, if that consideration was included in your report, whatever it is, thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. I have a Carol R showing up. You, you uh, Carol, you would need to unmute yourself on your end, I believe. We have unmuted you on our end. My only comment is Your that, name and address, please. Oh, 26 Olive Street, the corner of Olive and Russia. We're in a butter from Russia Street. And people buy properties to live in them and to make it their home. Developers are buying property to make a profit. And I think it's a loophole to have a mudroom pass through. And it boggles my mind that uh, a Russia Street shared must mudroom pass-through is an address and they're going to have four vehicles in the front drawer, front, um, front yard rather. And uh, I know this is something for the zoning board and so I'm not going to waste your time dwelling on that. But um, it is a concern. And the yard has been sacrificed. And I realize the historic commission, their hands are tied because the original building is basically being left in that. But something that was split down the middle, side by the side, is now front to back. And that was not probably what the neighborhood envisioned. So that's the end of my comment. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay. And remember to put your hand down, uh, Carol. I see a Dr. Ned McGrath. Uh, we, is your, let's see, we've got your talking, your audio enabled on our end. Can you unmute yourself and be heard? Hi, Glenn. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Thank you. Um, th this has been a really impressive series of meetings about this property, yeah, and I'd like to uh, thank our neighbors on Olive Street. I'm at 28 Olive Street, Ned McGrath, and Patricia, my wife. Uh, we've lived here for 40 plus years and always recognized and appreciated the 22-24 Olive Street property as a gem in the neighborhood. Um, it it's zoned R2, as is the neighborhood. And, and yet it somehow feels to me that this construction plan that the developer has is sort of sneaking under the wire here and, and generating an R3 kind of feeling in an R2 neighborhood. Uh, the massing is, is problematic for me. I think the addition is quite, quite handsome. It almost looks like it belongs on Beacon Hill, but I don't necessarily believe it, it, it belongs in the locale that it's being suggested for. Um, the yard there has historically been important to the neighbors because the previous owners, the Charmanskis, had glorious gardens there, uh, the produce of which they shared with all of us, I'm sure. And um, it strikes me as an opportunity lost if that land is covered with another building. 
Um, not only does it encroach on the neighborhood uh, adjacent to it, in terms of both Russia Street and the, the neighbor to the, to the easterly side, um, but it, it destroys the opportunity to have a gracious garden of the period that could be enjoyed by the two families that would occupy that gracious structure that exists facing Olive Street today. Uh, I'm concerned that we uh, lose the opportunity to retain a character of the neighborhood by seeing this kind of infill. And I would hope that we would consider that as, as uh, the members of the commission to, to view that as important enough to maintain that streetscape and that view um, on both the Olive Street perspective and the Russia Street perspective and thinking of the historical context of the structure in a whole. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McGrath, appreciate it. Give a few seconds to see if there are any other people wishing to speak. And if not, looks like everyone's had a chance, so I'll officially close the public comment period. So um, um, the, I'd like to give the applicant a, br a brief opportunity to uh, respond if you'd like to. Particularly, there was the, uh, I think, um, I believe it was Mark uh, Centron also asked this question about the square footage. So I know we talked about that. Um, so maybe we, we just need to quickly review it. What I heard was uh, 900 square feet on the first floor, 1,008 on the second floor. So that would be a total of 1,908 square feet for the, the the proposed addition. I assume that's both the, that's everything added on to the existing house. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, this yeah. is Lisa Mead. Um, almost, but not quite, because part of the, um, the living unit in the existing structure includes part of the, the um, connector as well. So the new unit plus its portion of the connector is 1908 um, of the, of the mudroom and the living space in the connector. That's a part of the new unit. I'm not quite sure exactly what that number is. And I don't know if Ernie has that number or not, but while he's looking, um, I would confirm that the metal roof on the connector is staying. Right. Um, and um, remind the board that this is currently a two family um, further remind the board, which I'm sure it's aware that until just a few years ago, this actually, this entire neighborhood was in the R3 district. And there is a number of multifamily houses, including the one directly across the street on Olive Street. Um, then I would also add that the applicant is actually reducing the lot coverage and increasing the open space over existing conditions. So the existing lot coverage is at 24.7% and the proposed lot coverage will be 23.6%. The existing open space is 67.8% and the proposed open space um, actually goes down a little bit is 65% because of the um, drives and sidewalks. But um, the lot coverage goes down. So. Um, I think that that addresses um, the specific questions. I think uh, I would also add uh, while we're chatting, um, there's 108 square feet of mudroom space for unit two, which is the existing building. That's part of the addition, okay? So if you add the 108 square feet for that mudroom to the um, uh, 1908, for unit one, which is entirely within the addition, the total addition is 2,016 square feet. Um, but we are demolishing um, 493 square feet from the site right now. So the net add to the property is 1523, 1,523 is the net add. So the addition itself is 2,016 the net ad is 1,523. 
Thank you very much for that. That's that's helpful data. Yep. Um, and it's interesting about the lot coverage. I assume that um, the lot coverage figure is, at, at, I'm uh, frankly a little amazed, is, is that probably partly because of the removal of some of the accessory structures and the fact that um, things like driveways and parking areas um, don't count as um, coverage, so to speak. Right. So, yeah. So the driveways don't, thank you, Mr. Chair, the driveways uh, don't go against lot coverage. It's anything right. under a roof and enclosed by walls. So right. the removal of the additions of the addition and then the removal of the accessory structures reduce the lot coverage, right? So there's actually less lot coverage. Right. Okay. Well, I certainly have a lot to think about. Um, let me turn to my fellow commissioners uh, and uh, kind of go around the board here, um, kind of in no particular order, um, you know, Mark, uh, Syndrome, any thoughts, comments? Uh, on how we are feeling about the the overall proposal? Um, I'm very sensitive to the abutters uh, concerns and uh, comments. Uh, I do agree that this is a structure that certainly changes the character and the nature of both the existing structure and the neighborhood. And that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about you, Mr. Morgan? Any, any thoughts? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I have no additional um, comments. Um, uh, I would, I would, I would make a motion, um, but I have no additional comments. Okay, uh, hold it just for a moment, and uh, you'll get an opportunity in just uh, in a moment. Uh, uh, Peter McNamee, any thoughts? As soon as I find my mute button. <laughs> um, like Mark, I'm sensitive to the abutters' comments. Um, having said that, I, I don't I don't have any tremendous problem with the uh, the the brick structure or the brick veneer structure. Um, the connector, I do have slight issues with still, um, and I wonder if it is necessary for it to be a double entry if it were possible to. Uh, transition that to a shorter connector and just less. It's 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 a prominent piece of the design as it's currently drawn. And I've gone back to the first proposal. I'm looking at that and I'm contrasting it with this, and it still makes a very serious statement. Um, so I would ask whether or not that was ever considered making that a single entry with a split on the inside, um, sort of a shared mud room, just to shrink that down and make it less of a statement. Uh, aside from that, um, I have no issues with the overall design of the addition. Okay. All right, and we'll give the applicant a chance to maybe answer that question in a moment. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, uh, so we heard your comment earlier, Chris uh, Fay, about the concern about the size. Anything you'd like to add or just wanna stay with that for now? Uh, no, I think I think that uh, I'll leave that stand. Okay. Okay. And uh, Malcolm, any any comments or thoughts overall? No, I'm I'm uh, fine with this. The only thing I I don't like is the symmetry of the right. uh, north side. Okay. Yep. Um. Okay. Yeah, and I'm I'm kind of torn too. I I sympathize with. Uh, or in agreement with a lot of comments about, you know, the I know there's considerable concern about the the impact this uh, potentially could have on the community. Uh, I one of the public commenters noted about the uh, actually I think it's sort of shown here the west elevation the lower part of the illustration that's uh, or the rendering that's we're looking at right now uh, to the left side of that you know there's the car and the tree and nothing else and I think you know so and I'm not I'm not faulting the architects here for this but it's a little um, unrealistic in that there are uh, other structures uh, there to the left of that so it's a little bit out of context, it's a little bit hard to see, you know, that neighborhood context that has uh, uh, 
got uh, several of butters uh, have have raised as a concern. I think um, you know it's understandable. There's a lot of concern all around the report about infill. It's been going on for excuse me for a while. And um, uh, on the other hand, the, um, we have the uh, as I'm sure you all know, there are zoning laws and regulations that both the applicants and uh, this commission, uh, you know, we, we can't overrule those necessarily. And there are certain things that can and cannot be done. They have, uh, they are in compliance, as I understand, with the various, strictly the zoning requirements, things like lot coverage, setbacks, and so on. So that's pretty much, uh, I don't think that's an issue. Um, and in fact, I don't even know if I offhand, I don't recall, I'm sure attorney me can clear, clarify that if they need to any official approvals from the ZBA on this, they might, for, uh, um, but we can address that. Um, uh, but the design wise, I think they've come a long way uh, from the first rendition, I think. Uh, that that um, north facade, uh, I kind of understand why that is the way it is, and I don't really have a because of its location and its uh, lack of visibility. I don't have a big problem with it. Um, so I think what it boils down to, I think what most people have expressed concern with is the overall massing and size, and to some degree the connector. I noticed that. Um, uh, that Caitlin, could you go up one slide to slide four for a second? I want to see if there's also two entrances. Yes, so on the connector, there's two entrances on both sides, um, which I guess is driven by the uh, the way the units are divvied up inside. Um, and this gets to uh, Mr. McNamee's concern about that. So maybe you can address if, you know, if that's absolutely necessary, because that might be a way of uh, kind of reducing the visual impact of that connector, maybe even making it uh, slightly shorter, which would um, bring in the whole uh, thing slightly and uh, reduce that impression of mass somewhat without a huge sacrifice in uh, interior space. So maybe I'll, I'll give you, give you a chance, um, uh, Attorney Mead and, and or, and or the, the uh, rather architect to respond to the, the, the question about that connector and the entrances and, um, um, what was the other one? The other thing I mentioned, which has already flown out of my mind. Sorry about that. Oh, about um, whether you, you need anything, any approvals from the ZBA. That was the other question. Sure, I, I can address that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we do, we are getting a special permit uh, for non conformities from the ZBA um, because it's a two family um, with insufficient lot area for the two family. So we're modifying that even though we're not changing the lot area and improving everything else. So we do need to go to the ZBA. Um, as to the connector, I'm going to um, let um, Ernie address that. Um, I believe the answer is we might be able to make that one door, um, but it would not shorten the connector um, because of the space constraints in the shared space. So Ernie, I think you want to address that. Yeah, I think as you as you say, uh, Lisa, I believe that uh, there's a potential to have a single door on one of the two sides of the connector building, either on Russia or on the north facade, um, most likely not on both because of uh, space constraints on the interior. Um, if we were to have one door on the exterior, then we would have two internal doors. So you'd have uh, uh, essentially a common uh, space with uh, a door into each unit on the interior. Um, by doing so, we would not be able to shorten the connector in any dimension uh, because we would need more maneuvering space internally to accommodate that change. So, um, I, I think that summarizes what the possibilities are for the connector. Mr. Chair, if you're speaking, I think you're muted. Sorry, thank you. I was muted and I was speaking. The um, want to uh, be fair to the applicant and, and um, 
the they've been this is the second time they've returned with uh, modified plans and they've been responsive so far so uh i and i do want to express my appreciation for that uh mr um uh morgan you said you were thinking of a motion was the motion uh to uh, approve this and then we can vote up or down on that was that what you were thinking yes sir may i make that motion you may i move that the board approve the proposed addition to 2224 Olive Street and that we lift the demolition delay. Okay. Is there a second for that? There's not having a second. Um, uh, well, I'll second it because I think it'd be helpful to have a vote on that, so they, so everyone kind of has an idea where the commission stands. So um, I don't think it's out of order for the chair to, to second that. Well, I'll second um, that if you like. Okay, was that Peter speaking? Okay. Okay, so we'll go around the board here. Uh, Malcolm Carmath. Yeah, I, I'm affirmative. Okay, that's a yes vote. Uh, Mark Syndrome. The motion is to approve the plans as submitted. Uh, a yes vote, uh, list the demolition the delay, a no vote uh, does not. No. Okay, no vote. Uh, Christopher Fay? Uh, I'm a no. Okay, thank you. Peter McNamee? No. Okay, uh, Joe Morgan? Yes. Okay. Um, the chair, hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm actually willing to go along with this. Let me see what that gives us. One, two, three yeses. That's just one short of a quorum uh, a, a approval quorum. So uh, the motion fails. Um, so what, in fairness to the applicant, can uh, can is there anything we can definitive or try to um, communicate clearly that what they could do that would um, enable those people who are um, not in favor to turn around. Uh, I, it's, you know, something maybe hopefully a little bit more specific than just saying not so big. Glenn, if I may, this is Peter. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Um, I'll go back to the point that I was making before about the entryways in, in the connector uh, and encourage uh, the architect to do what's possible to shorten that. Um, I, I, I recognize it's not optimal because it does take away interior space, but I think that, that would make a big difference, certainly from the Russia Street side. Uh, I'm not sure I understand why it would have to be double entry on one side and single on the other. Uh, but we don't need to get into that. I just encourage them to look uh, long and hard at that. Okay, yeah, and I agree that the preferred side for the single entry would be the Russia Street side as the, the very visible side. Um, I know others who were feeling that it needs more work. Any other sp specific comments um, that would be helpful to the applicants if they understand what, you know, where the bar is? Glenn, I, this is Chris. I think, I mean, I don't, this is not an addition. We, we can call this is not an addition to the house. This is a whole separate house. So unless we're going to make it an addition, I'm a, I'm going to be a no, no matter what. I mean, the, the, the connecting piece, that's an addition. The connecting piece has to be there because otherwise it's not an addition. It's a separate structure. Right. So this is, I've seen this before. I, I saw this in, many years ago, my next door neighbor. And I'm not saying it's the same thing, that there's not going to be living space there, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a, to me, my opinion, it's a bit of a sleight of hand, mm -hmm. architecturally and constructionally speaking. Yeah. So I, I don't have anything more to offer as far as what you could do, except, you know, have it be an addition. And even then, right. questionable for me. Okay. All right. And a couple of people have also have made similar comments, Chris. So I think we understand what you're getting at. Uh, I think a number of public commenters and I think others in the commission have said that uh, it 
quote unquote reads as if it's a separate structure almost. Um, uh, okay. Um, anyone else like to comment before we um, close this part of the um, agenda? Mr. Yeah, I'd like to say something. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Malcolm. Um, it's unfortunate, but we live in what I consider an 18th century English seaport. And we're trying to preserve it, but the zoning laws are designed for subdivisions on the other side of 95. And when we drop those zoning laws over an 18th century English seaport, what we're going to get is infill all the time. We're actually forcing developers to do what we're trying to avoid. It's, it's un unfortunate, but, uh, that's the way it works out. I mean, these guys come here and their their hands are tied by the zoning laws. And then we object to it, but the laws are what, what are the problem, in my opinion. And is there anything, well, what would you suggest the, it, um, let me see what you're, uh, you were, okay, you were, you were okay with the plans as submitted, uh, <clears throat> notwithstanding your, the concerns that you're, you're, you're stating right now, uh, but given given the constraints of the zoning laws and so on, as far as the overall design of, of what they've proposed, you don't have any um, specific comments on how that might be improved, I take it. Did we lose? That was a question for, for you, Malcolm. Um, yeah, I... Um... It's, it's a frustrating situation because we force people to, they, they could create an, another building which could be aesthetically pleasing, uh, but then we force them, force them to attach it to the original building, which is, I think, unfortunate. I think, uh, you know, these guys have worked very hard to try to put a decent plan together um, but, you know, uh, we, have, we have houses that are built right on the street, but the zoning laws call for setbacks. Right. Right. We have houses that are built right up against one another in historic neighborhoods that are forced to have setbacks. It's just, right. uh, it's always going to be a problem, I think. It's, a, it's unfortunate. Yeah, and that, that's probably the, the variance that, uh, that uh, the attorney was talking about, that it, there's an existing, quote, nonconformity, because as you say, the old construction does not conform with the, the newer zoning laws. All right, well, thank you, Malcolm, for your comments. Um, uh, attorney Mead, I think uh, you, you wanted to say something before we yeah, move on. I do, yeah, I do. And I think that um, it's actually um, a good segue from what um, Malcolm just said. So. Um, the applicant's going to go back and look at, obviously, the suggestion related to the one door. Um, you know, the read is that that connector, making the connector smaller is not possible to actually uh, still comply with requirements for the zoning. But um, I, I want to say also that um, the owner of this property has choices, um, as does everybody, right? And in this particular instance, this property is a very large piece of property. And what the owner is not proposing, which the owner could do by right without coming to the historic commission or to the zoning board, is to put a very large addition on the back of this house, including an attached garage with rooms over at the same height of the house by right. And they're not proposing to do that um, because they're proposing to do something else that they think is more appropriate and in keeping with the neighborhood. And so I think that's the balance that everybody needs to think about when reviewing these kinds of proposals on these unique circumstances. Um, and so with that, I would just say that the, the owner is going to go back and work with the architect to see if um, he can address the um, issues related to the door or doors, if you will, in the connector. and um, we would come back at your, um, I think at your next meeting, if that's possible. It should be, I believe that's October 20, uh, something, let me see, 28th. Is that right, uh, Caitlin? Yep, that's right, Chair. Okay. So we'd appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Sure. 
Okay, that that will be fine. We can uh, 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 plug, put you on the agenda for the twenty eighth. I don't think we officially need to vote a continuance since it's not a an open right uh, matter at that, that in that sense. But uh, but we can certainly uh, have Caitlin put you on the uh, agenda for the twenty eighth. Assuming you feel that will give you enough time to. I think so. I think that um, the architect can take a look at that and we'll get you new materials in a week. And if not, um, we obviously would tell yeah. the board and ask. Okay. All right. Very good. And I appreciate your, your patience and I appreciate, uh, as I said earlier, uh, working with the commission on this. Okay. Um, uh, we'll hear from you again, attorney me in a little bit, but right now we turn to uh, the next matter, which is 30 Winter Street. Uh, this is a similar uh, review of a demolition plan. Uh, the owner developer is Mr. Eric Kremiak. He um, has been before the board. The property is 30 Winter Street. It's uh, currently under demolition delay. And uh, Mr. Premack has um, supplied uh, some additional uh, comments and um, a, a memo, uh, which I believe you've seen. So um, uh, let's see, did, I think Caitlin shared with the members of this commission the quote unquote memo, which um, uh, Mr. Premack uh, reviewed after my modifications. Basically, I just reorganized a little bit. So it read the, the things were arranged a little bit more logically. Uh, I didn't really, I uh, didn't change anything that uh, he's agreed to do. Just uh, plugged in some, made things a bit more specific so we could be very clear on what was or was not uh, in the plan. Um, so you've seen that. I also had Caitlin share with you uh, some of the uh, estimates and information from the Window Woman uh, organization over in Amesbury. Uh, the purpose of that was to mainly uh, so that you as the commissioners could, and myself actually for that matter too, I didn't realize quite how costly it was going to be to uh, restore the windows. I know it is costly in general. And Mr. Premack, uh, I'll let you speak in just a second. Um, I, I think you understand that we, I would, we slash I was never suggesting you restore all the windows, mainly uh, we were mostly concerned with the uh, Winter Street facade, uh, but, I but I understand your concern about the uh, the cost of that and seeing the estimates from the one the window, I almost said Wonder Woman, the window woman, I do understand, you know, that that is definitely a concern. So uh, one quick question and then I'll turn the uh, audio over to you, Eric, I assume you're here. I am. See, yep, you're there. Good. A uh, uh, quick question, Eric. The if I can be so informal, in the draft minutes I, I was checking earlier, it said that it, it. It. I don't know if this is a verbatim quote. I suspect it's not. But it, your quote is saying uh, the new windows would be vinyl simulated divided lights with grates on the outside and spaces between the panes. Um, now. I just wanted to clarify that because uh, there's spacers, which as a type of is sort of an, a, an upgrade from um, simulated divided light. It's like SDLS, where it has uh, actual sort of spacer bars between each um, light as opposed to just the internal grid. I'm suspecting that's not what you meant. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I assume you meant that would have the internal grid plus the uh, applied Munton, um, uh, you know, what you call the 3D um, Muntons on the, on the exterior. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. So is there anything you'd like to say about either, um, you know, you know, the, the plan? Well, why don't you kind of go, go through, I know you changed uh, the roof in the back and, and so on. So why don't I let you uh, just quickly review uh, what, what the changes you've made? Yeah, no, I appreciate the uh, editing that you did. And um, it looks very good. Um, as you can see, we, uh, you know, the, the big question, for a couple of members of the board was the, were the, uh, the, the gable in the back. Mm -hmm. So we, we dropped that down and I think we really only had to drop it down about, I'm not even sure if it was a foot. Um, I think it was a, a, essentially about three boards length. So maybe it's about nine inches or 12, 12 inches so that you could see the gable. Um, you know, it's going to give us a little bit of a, a lower height than we, wanted uh in the first floor and the second floor but um it's livable we can we can we can make it we can make it work 
Uh, the second thing was there was question about uh, the structural uh, stability of the back section. And we decided rather than trying to uh, patchwork the first and second floor by what existed, uh, we would just tear it off. It's still, we're still under the 25%. And by tearing it down, we can reframe it and make sure that it's solid so we don't have to worry about any structural issues. Um, every, everything else, I think, it remained the same from the original proposal. Um, again, replacing, replacing all, the, all the windows as, as they are existing, whether they're 12 over 12, 12 over 8, 9 over 6, 6 over 6, uh, keeping all the exterior trim the same, matching, replacing, repairing, uh, keeping the siding the same, um, three-inch reveal, um, you know, seat of clap, Mm -hmm. um, keeping the chimneys in the front, just, uh, you know, tearing that one off in the rear. That's mm -hmm. pretty much a mess anyways. And, um, I think that's about it. Okay. I just had one question. Um, I'm trying to understand that, that the new, uh, roof line you've got, you know, is it, uh, the membrane roof line here that this is the one that you've changed, uh, and see exactly how that plays. We're looking straight on in this rear elevation. So I see the, the ridge or Eve, I should say of that, of the, of the addition is below that gable, uh, as, as you just stated. And I see a line that's a little above, I assume, that's where the addition meets the existing house. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Okay, Kaylin, I want to get the side view. I just want to just just trying to visualize this a little bit better, so I can uh, show it. Want to? Hopefully, there's a view that shows the side. Oh, maybe it's below there. Um, let's see if this one shows it. No, is there a side view? Okay. One more. There we go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the well, that's the, the right side. You probably can see, I think you could only see it from the left, maybe. It's actually tough to, it's tough because there's, you have gables on both sides. Yeah. So it's so, hard to see. It's only, it's just a slight, yeah, you can see it there a little bit. So I it's, see. Just a, it's just a, you know, it's a very small pitch from the bottom, right. you know, from the right. base of that gambrel. Right. And then it and then it runs almost flat. I mean, it's not right. going to be flat, flatted, but it's probably right. going to be no more than a one and a half pitch. Right. Okay. Actually, in in, in you know when I was looking at these earlier, uh, Mr. Premack, I was actually glad to see, or one of the positive impacts is that the that that. Well, hardly anyone's going to see it because, as you know, there's a property right next door, I believe. Uh, yes. But the the overall shape of the house actually sort of improves a bit because you have the full gambrel from, you know, Eve uh, down to the, to the Eve sort of the rear matching the front a little bit better, which sort of it's kind of an improvement, I think. Anyway, okay, so thank you for, uh, for clarifying that. So I'll turn it over to uh, my compatriots on the board. Uh, does anyone have a question for Mr. Premack? You want to clarify anything? Not hearing anything. Um, so uh, shall I should I go around the board? Uh, does anyone have any? comment in the way of by way of deliberation on this chair sure. mr morgan has a question yes. oh i yep. just saw the hand go up yeah go ahead joe so i guess i volunteered to go first here <laughs> <laughs> i i think uh actually your comment uh, chair that you just made i think is uh, a really good one um to preserve that existing profile of the gambo roof uh the flat roof I, you know i know uh, commissioner pecknick uh really it was important for her to preserve a sloped roof there, but I, I do believe that this gives a pretty good result on the existing uh, main portion of the building, um, mm -hmm. which is the gambrel portion with its L on the north side. So I, um, I like this. I think this satisfies my concerns. And I would also uh, agree um, with, uh, with Mr. Uh, Premac, that the but by you know admitting, I mean it, it basically acknowledging, I guess is the word that you're, he's ending, he's going to end up tearing down the entire rear portion anyway. It really is a demolition job. That's uh, a partial demo of the structure, 
that um, and as long as he's not touching, I guess the bones of the of that original principal structure, the gambrel structure, uh, and its L, then I, I then I I think I would I would back off on the requirement for um, the structural report. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, I I think I was I, I mean I I still feel to some degree that when we touch a building of this vintage that it's would always be a good act of just due diligence to do mm -hmm. um, to do the structural conditions report and um, from a third party to in case there's something that's not noticed uh, by the um, by the owner and uh, and his or her contractor I think that it's always good. Uh, to do that, but uh, I, I would be okay if we understand that it's just the rear portion that's going to be entirely rebuilt with new foundation work and new structure, uh, and, and it will be, and it will be sistered onto the original building. Then I think that would be fine with me. So that's my comments. Yeah, and I would expect that there's a a post that comes down pretty much at that where that uh, rear eave is, so to speak. Uh, Mr. Premack, do you want to? Uh, address that comment. It's it you know, and confirm or or correct uh, the impression that it, that the the timber frame construction of the old part of the house is, is it not going to be um, modified or interfered with. That's correct. I mean, if we need, you know, if we get in there and we see anything that we need, uh, absolutely, we we always call the structural engineer. If we get in and we see something that we don't like, and or if we need to. In this case, I, I honestly doubt it because we're not doing anything that's going to add any, you know, any structure or any weight to this. We're just, you know, we're doing right. it over. So it's tearing right. it off and doing it over. So right. we should be fine as long as everything's in there. We're not, you know, we're not opening up a big room inside to put, you know, that we need to put in, uh, you know, any, any big headers or, right. or, you know, it, anything more than that's already there. So, okay. uh, you know, worst case scenarios will be, you know, replacing, replacing any posts or beams, but, right. uh, you know, okay. I should add that, that. Yeah. We won't be touching the, you know, we shouldn't be touching anything on the original. Okay. I should add then that, um, you know, your, um, your, your, the plans that you submit should, you know, should show what you, you know, exactly what you plan to demolish so that um, the planning board can, can, you know, review that and have those plans uh, that are accurate to what you actually plan to do. And um, if, if you do encounter something that requires you to go beyond what's planned, of course, uh, it, it's, you need to, to go back and check in with the, the building inst inspector or the planning board to make sure that, um, uh, you don't kind of exceed whatever your um, demo permit um, specifies. Um, but I think you probably already know that, So, but I just want to make sure that's understood. Yeah, that's always the case. Yep, that, that's right. It is. Uh, any other, uh, uh, Peter, Mark, anyone that like to further comment? Nope. No. I think we should move to accept this. Would you like to make a motion to accept the plan, uh, Malcolm? You can if you wish. So moved. Okay. So there's a Chair. motion. Chair, yep. this, yes. is, this is Joe Morgan. I, I just would like one other clarification. I don't know. Did we settle on the window work scope? What are we, what's actually, what did we decide? Oh. Yeah, the, I think the short answer is, 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 Yes, in the sense that the current plans call for the the windows uh, are not going to be restored. He plans to replace the windows. He is going to use all the uh, the patterns of lights. You know whether it's you know twelve over in, over eight or six over six, whatever. Those will all be the same. And in, uh, as you might have seen in the memo, yeah, in the memo here, it it's specific about the type uh, of windows. Uh, there. Um, they refer to as their energy efficient STL, that's uh, simulated divided light, paren, which includes 3D exterior grates. And again, and uh, it specifies that things such as the openings, location, and size, that, that's going to all be the same. The trindo, the tr excuse me, the trim, that is the window and door surrounds, corner boards, et cetera, is repaired or replaced in kind, you know, all things which uh, Mr. Premack has uh, already said. So, yeah, so the, cur the current plan does not include. Um, uh, restoration, 
of, of any of the windows but replacement. I think that's probably what you were asking. Um, well, um, the, at the last presentation, there was a cut for a paradigm window, which is a white vinyl window. And I don't, I, I don't know if that was a mistake or what, but it looked like a proposal for a white vinyl window. And I don't, I don't know if I would be on board with that. I think that, that there should be some uh, original, or there should be some window restoration. I think we can talk about what the scope of that is, but I believe that <laughs> I don't think it would be acceptable to install white vinyl windows um, uh, throughout. I, I mean, I, it, it, yeah, sir, I, I, I don't think we've, yeah. I don't, I don't think we've typically taken that position on other, uh, uh, you know, 18th century buildings. Can I address um, that quick? Sure. Yes, yes, please. please. Yeah, we had, that was just a, that was a sample. Uh, it was a sample, uh, uh, you know, window page. Uh, hasn't been, hasn't been definitely decided whether we're using Paradigm, whether we're using Marvin, whether we're using Harvey, uh, but we are using a black exterior with black grates. That, that much has been decided because, uh, believe it or not, I already, I already have a, a buyer for this house who is already with, you know, has, has expressed uh, her opinions as far as not wanting wood windows because she doesn't want to deal with having to paint them every so often. And, um, you know, they're either going to be a, a, a fiberglass or a vinyl clad, uh, but they are going to be a, of a black exterior, not a white, if that makes a difference to you. Um, if, if, if I may jump in on this, um, the Please. cut for the paradigm windows is still part of the, the current presentation. So right. I think we would make a condition of, uh, of whatever vote we have that a, that an appropriate cut for, uh, uh, Ms. Primack is describing black, uh, the current cut says white, um, and whatnot, just to have an accurate presentation there. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Peter. I was going to say the same thing. Um, the, and and Eric, what we're talking about is, and it kind of refers to my earlier comment that the the final plans um, need to be accurate and complete and uh, reflect what you actually plan to do. So um, I suppose yeah, we, I we can realize that was still in there. I, I would have taken it out. Okay. Do you have, can you, are you in a position to, to uh, specify exactly what you, like, it sounds like you we weren't quite sure what you're going to use or do you, or do you know? As far as manufacturer, no, we don't know because it, uh, a lot has to do with the availability these days as mm -hmm. you, you know, I don't know if you guys know that just about everything is beyond yeah. backed up these days. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's ordering the windows and sometimes you, sometimes you can get a, you know, eight week lead time and sometimes you get a 28 week lead time. And mm -hmm. so you have to pick and choose between your manufacturers. I mean, I consider them all to be good windows. They all have uh, the same features. Again, if you want to, you know, just put it in there as uh, what you already have is the, you know, the SDL with the 3d grates uh, and black. Um, I can, certainly provide a, a cut sheet at the time. Okay. And that, that description with those, with those features is a part of the memo. I'm sorry. Uh, that description with, with the exception of the color is in the memo. The exception uh, of the color. Yeah. So we would simply uh, add that, uh, that color to the, to, to, to that. But but it, but it, but the SDL with exterior grates is in there, and the pattern of lights is is in there, and so on. And um, did you say, Eric, is your plan to use uh, wood clad with fiberglass or, or vinyl, or solid vinyl, or with fiberglass, or what's the deal on that? As long as we're uh, talking about be, windows, they'd be they'd be solid, either either vinyl or fiberglass, both both inside and out. Okay. Um, Joe, what, um, so, uh, what's, how far does that go towards, uh, resolving your uh, concern and well, I'll, I'll hold off. Well, I, I, it's like, it's, uh, 
That's a good question. I, <laughs> you know, if we, if this is, if this is a, a rest in, in the context of a restoration or preservation, uh, we would want to retain in principle, right. the existing materials always. Yeah. And yeah. in the report done by, um, window woman, they, she made, she said very clearly, even though there are some openings that are in bad condition because there's been no effort to maintain the property over the last few decades, that the windows, because they were very well constructed replacement windows there with, you know, true joinery and very good quality that they were salvageable. At high cost, yes, okay, we know that, but nonetheless, she could, uh, her team could restore missing uh, frames and muttons and glass and restore the, some of the, uh, restore and restore the openings. So um, I think in the context of a preservation, a true historic preservation, clearly that would be the direction we take. Now, Mr. Yeah. Premack is saying he has a buyer who doesn't want wood windows, does not want the burden of maintaining wood windows. So uh, that, that I mean, for me, that throws me a curve. I don't know what to think about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm you. saying? You know, if someone doesn't want wood windows because they don't want to maintain them, yeah. I don't know how to fit that into um, yeah. into the best of all possible worlds. Here. Yeah, I, I know what and, that and, world uh, is actually. So that, that, that's quite right. And and even you know and, and the fa in fact, uh, there's nothing that would prevent some future owner. They would not need any special permission to replace lovely, you know, accurate uh, reproduction windows with uh, you know vinyl or whatever. Uh, Peter, I see a hand up. Did you want to comment? Oh, hand went down. Okay, I guess you already commented. Yeah, uh, I, I I totally I hear you very much. Um, well, and and also you know an owner uh, there's a quote for storm windows which are uh, applied to the exterior. Someone has to get up on a ladder and take those down and put them up every season, I believe, because and then there's no operability, there's no access to fresh air uh, with those storm windows in place. So. I don't know. There, you know, I think I do believe that there's a real argument that an owner who occupies uh, a house such as this, even though it's a historical vintage house, uh, there are there are certain aspects of that maintenance which are going to be a burden. And I, but I, but here, I don't know. I don't know what the commission is supposed to do in this context where we have a historical structure and we're we're encouraged to require owners who make these proposals to in, to indeed restore the existing windows if they can be preserved. Yeah. I don't... Well, we certainly, well, we can't, uh, well, we, how do I, let me try to answer your question. Um, we can't legally force or require much of anything. We can, we can, uh, we can certainly recommend uh, which we actually have done uh, all in the on this particular property, recommend uh, at least for the at the very minimum for the front facade, you know, wood windows and so on, so it would look authentic. Um, the the uh, Mr. Premack or the owner ha certainly has the option of uh, you know uh, either uh, accommodating that or waiting waiting out the demo delay. Uh, you know, it usually, usually we try to avoid that and try to, you know, kind of come to some, for lack of a better term, negotiated, uh, you know, agreement that we can both uh, kind of live with. I think my, my sense of the, of the board from previous meetings and th comments people have made is that, you know, oh, I think I feel a lot of, uh, I think we're, a lot of us have this um, conflict between, on the one hand, it's, it's just a, a, a real gem of an old property. There's not many of this vintage left on the other hand, right? So there's that. On the other hand, it's in awful shape and really needs rehabilitation. Uh, so we have a developer here who's purchased it, is willing to, uh, you know, short of <laughs> willing to quasi restore it, you know, fix it up, shall we say, uh, it you know within reason uh, you know it would still have you know wood siding uh, you know wood trim you know it would all be you know correct with the exception of the material of the windows uh, so you know it's 
you know, is this that compromise? You know, maybe that's, to be honest, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm tend to be leaning. I, that's new information for me about the, the buyer. So yeah, I, I agree that kind of uh, definitely puts a bit of a spin on it. Uh, so uh, as far as formally, it, there is a proposed uh, motion uh, still on the floor. It hasn't been seconded yet. Uh, Malcolm did uh propose we take a vote on whether or not to approve these plans. Um, is there any other discussion or or a second on that? I'll second the motion, Mr. Peter. Okay, thank you, Peter. All right, so now there's a motion and a second, so we'll take a vote on that. So uh, I, I'll take them the same order I've been doing. So Malcolm, this is alphabetical, your vote? Uh, yes, move forward. Okay, uh, Mark Syndrome? No. Okay, thank you. Christopher Fay? I'm a yes. Okay, thank you. Peter? Yes. Okay, thank you. Joe Morgan? <laughs> <laughs> I, I sympathize with you, Joe. I know it's a tough one. I guess I'll have to say yes. Okay, and uh, the chair, uh, again, somewhat reluctantly also is a yes, mainly because I, I think the, the sense is that we, you know, um, we do want to see the house uh, fixed up, uh, brought back to life, um, you know, with a, you know, and back looking like it really should. Um, I implore, um, so what we'll need to do is in this decision, um, uh, Mr. Premack, we will note that the the color of the windows it will be black. Uh, if you have any changes, I, I don't know. It, it sounds like. Um, well, let me ask you this: In what you've, I, I know, I assume you haven't applied for an actual demolition permit yet. But when um, your your final plans are going to need to show the extent of exactly what you plan to demolish and all that. So, uh, so you'll need to. So this this. Um, I'm going to, uh, this approval is that um, the, the, the memo is included as part of the plans that specifies the materials and so forth. We've all agreed to that. Uh, the one exception there is the, the color black and um, the other, can, you know, the other stipulation, which is no news to you, I'm sure, is that you're, you know, you'll need to submit, a, you know, a final plan, which clearly indicates exactly what you plan to demolish and, um, you know, what, what's going to be rebuilt in its place and so forth. Um, but obviously it'll, it'll, follow the, the the lines that you've presented tonight and have submitted um, with you know whatever other details the building commissioner might require as far as demo and so on does that sound reasonable it does you, and, I'll, yeah. and i'll get uh i'll get caitlin a uh a new cut sheet uh as soon as possible so that um you can add that to the add that to the package Okay, and I guess one final thing, I can't require this, but it, you know, it, 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 it does pain me a bit to, 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 to see the final windows in the front. So, you know, I would encourage you to at least, you know, think about if there's some reasonable cost, energy efficient uh, treatment that at least that front could do. I know it, it may be cost prohibitive and I understand that, but at least, you know, think about it. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Premack. Appreciate you coming back. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Good night. Good night. Okay. Um, 64 at Liberty Street. Uh, I believe uh, Attorney Mead will be speaking for the applicant again. This is uh, another review. Um, this was the uh, property in, uh, on Liberty Street where there was a, a relatively small addition being constructed on the back, um, one and a half, about one and a half, one, well, one to two stories, how it was described which replaces a one-story addition. So there's been some changes to the plan. So Attorney Mead, would you like to uh, present uh, what's been changed and we can hopefully uh, address that? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lisa Mead, Mead Teller McCloss to 30 Green Street on behalf of Eve Lee, who, Eve Lee, who is the owner of 64 Liberty Street. Um, so at the last meeting, uh, the board asked for some more details and clarification 
um, on the plans. And uh, the last couple of weeks, the applicant, uh, along with the architect, Julie McDonald, who's not able to be with us this evening, um, had undertaken those changes. So you can go to the next slate slide, please. So um, the specifically, uh, more specific details were provided regarding the types of windows being proposed, speaking of windows, uh, and the dimensions thereof. Uh, we've noted on the plans, it's Marvin Ultimate Wood windows um, proposed uh, that are being proposed to be used. The size and location of the windows on the addition have been finalized, which hadn't been before. Uh, those are also um, located and noted on the plan, particularly the second floor windows on the west elevation of the addition match the size of the remaining existing second story windows of the original home on the same elevation. Um, and we noted the sizes on each of those as well. So um, when we go to the plans, you'll see now um, that those sizes are um, consistent on the addition as well as on the um, existing. The proposed elevations themselves are also now in line drawing format and no longer have the appearance of being sketch plans. Uh, and the details showing the materials of the proposed addition, you can go to the next slide, please, um, Caitlin. Um, that match the existing structure, including the cedar shake roof shingles and the wooden clabbered siding are noted on the plans. Uh, more specific height information was added to the plans. There was some confusion at the last meeting. Uh, specifically, we'll show on the plans, the proposed north elevation, the ridge height of the existing structure at 29 feet, one inch. The ridge height of the two-story portion of the addition is at 2210 and the one story portion is at 13 feet, eight inches. Um, and then the uh, proposed west elevation shows the mean roof height of the existing structure, which is the tallest at 22.8, and the proposed mean is 20. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So here's the existing structure. It's now the, the line drawings of the existing. Next slide, please. And here's the proposed structure. And you'll see now the windows um, are um, consistent with the existing structure, types of windows, the materials on the finishes are all uh, pointed out um, as well as um, on the existing structure. And you can see um, the lines um, more clearly and it's no longer a sketch plan. Next slide, please. And then here's the existing elevation on the west. Um, and the next slide, please. And here's the proposed elevation. Um, and uh, so you can see, again, we call out the materials and the uh, window ma manufacturer, again, and the type of windows, type of the door, uh, I think all of those details um, the board were looking for, in addition to the mean height um, of both uh, proposed and existing, which clearly shows, as the chair noted, it's you know smaller in dimension and in height, um, and um, doesn't overwhelm the existing gambrel end of the existing structure. Next slide, please. And this is the existing south elevation uh, and the proposed. Um, and here's the proposed south elevation, again, noting all of the materials uh, to be used on the um, addition. And the next slide, please. Pardon the interruption. Is that correct that there are no windows on that side? In that, that, is, that is correct. You might recall, um, and we have some photos I'll show you in a minute, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's very tight down yeah, there. Right. Um, the the Tushes live next door. They're supportive of the project. You note that we provided that letter okay. of support um, before. Um, but yeah, that's true. There are no windows. Yep. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. Oh, this and then that this is the end. Nothing changes on that end. Um, and then you can see here, Mr. Chair, how close they are. Yeah. Um, in the with the next door neighbors. So with that, um, I think that the applicant addressed everything that the board had requested before, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, well, fellow 
panelists, does anyone have a question or a comment, a uh, question for Trini Mead or thoughts about the, uh, the project? Everyone's very quiet. Um, well, I would agree with uh, Attorney Mead's comment that you, you are, it looks like you have done a good job of addressing uh, the things that were brought up. I know myself, and I think Peter also had, uh, was concerned about the, you know, the, um, there was some mismatch among the windows, particularly on that uh, Liberty Street side. And uh, I know Patricia Pecknick was not here tonight, but had some questions about the height, which you've, um, you know, so basically it was just some dimensions that weren't there that been, that have all been now supplied. And I, uh, I'm very happy that you have done a thorough job of documenting the materials to be used and so on. That That's all for the good. If um, if no one has any comments, concerns, questions, uh, does anyone have a motion? This would be the motion to approve this amended plan or not? I'll move that. Was that Malcolm? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's a motion to approve the this latest rendition of the plans. And I'll uh, second it. This is Joe. Okay. Thank you, uh, Joe Morgan. So uh, your vote on that, uh, Malcolm? Uh, yes, I, I accept. Okay. Uh, Mark Sindron? Yes. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, Christopher Fay? Did we lose Chris? Oh, no, I don't see him on the panelists. I think we, oh, there yeah, is. Christopher, there, there you are. Chris, are you with us? Uh, your vote on this? We're voting on to approve or not the 64 Liberty Street plan. Sorry. Oh, your I audio felt, is... Uh, this is a real discussion. I don't remember. Uh, your audio is... Hello? Yeah, yeah, your audio is kind of screwy, but I... So intermittently hearing you clearly okay. and you now? Hearing you clearly. yeah, right now we can. Okay. I, I don't recall this property. So... You, you cut out right after I don't recall the property. I'm not sure. I don't know what the date is. It was first discussed. Um, mm -hmm. well, hello. Okay. So I gonna... don't, I don't know what date this was discussed. Yeah. Oh, September okay. Well, you... Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't here for that. Yeah. Well, you're, Legally entitled to to vote if you approve or disapprove, or you can abstain. That's fine too. I would. I think I would abstain. Okay, that that's perfectly fine. Uh, Peter McNamee. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Joe Morgan. Yes. Thank you, and uh, the chair is in the affirmative as well. So that gives uh, one, two, three, four, five affirmative votes, which uh, approves the motion. So the uh, applicant can move on to their. Uh, you know, whatever your next phase is, I'm not sure if you probably need uh, some continuing some existing nonconformities and that sort of thing, but um, you're good to go from the standpoint of the Historic Commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and we will indeed be onward to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yes. Okay. Thank you very right. much, uh, Attorney Mead. Take care. Okay. Good night. Um, okay. A couple of other quick things I think we can... Um, review very briefly. Uh, one is that you might have noticed on the agenda, a correspondence that was a letter from the Mass Historical Commission about that uh, Purchase Street restriction. 64 Purchase Street is that church, uh, what is it? Um, Pres not Presbyterian, uh, I, I'm forgetting. The one. This was the one that Joe Morgan- Methodist maybe? Pardon me? Is it Methodist? It could be. It's the one. It's 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 the one. I'm a, Joe might remember because I know he started helping them with this, but then they went. They did hire a, uh, an attorney to help them draft this. Uh, there was a little bit of a mix up. Apparently, um, I did. We signed off or approved of their uh, uh, preservation restriction. Mass Historic had given them a, a sort of a, a letter of con, you know conditional approval. Uh, that was the version that we, we signed off on, but apparently they were accidentally sent an uncorrected version, which they returned for, for that correction to be made. And my understanding from Caitlin that that's already been taken care of. So this is really, at this point, it's just kind of an FYI that there was a bit of a hiccup in that, but uh, it, it, my understanding, you know, Caitlin correct me, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, uh, that everything is um, 
uh, either in the process or has been uh, resolved on that. But that was what that correspondence was. Um, and as far as updates from the chair, I'll be, just be very brief. Um, I have been meeting as a representative from this group of, with the Community Preservation Committee. In fact, we just had a meeting yesterday evening and also the building subcommittee of the New Report Energy Advisory Committee. Um, so uh, I would encourage anyone on the on the board to to think about it now that you've had a bit more time it kind of came suddenly last year uh, we were looking for the the, the community preservation committee uh, i think they're uh by ordinance required to have someone from the historical commission and it's appropriate that they do this is the committee that uh reviews and approves or or modifies or whatever uh, applications made for community preservation funds for various projects and many of them do involve historic preservation or uh, touch upon historic preservation if it's something, let's say, uh, a, a park or something that abuts, that either has historical value on its in its own right or abuts historic, excuse me, historical uh, properties and so on. So um, you don't need an answer right now tonight, but I would, I know, I'm, you know, being both chair of this committee and also on both of those, it, it is kind of starting to take a, a bit of a toll. So I think probably the Community Preservation Committee, if someone would be interested in doing that, that's a pretty light assignment. Um, you only meet a few times a year and it's kind of a bit, if I, I almost can say it's a fun job, it's it's really not so bad at all. Um, and the building subcommittee, we, we've, we um, it's been interesting. Uh, we're Again, you know that they wanted someone from the historical committee, excuse me, commission, because a lot of, you know, they're they're looking at ways to improve energy efficiency, and as as I'm sure you're all aware, so many elderly properties and historic properties in this town, we want to be able to improve in energy efficiency without sacrificing historical values and historical. Uh, uh, aspects of things. So that's been very interesting. Um, uh, things we had a very interesting call this week with Carissa Demore. She's a team leader for preservation services for historic New England. And she shared a number of resources and leads. And to be honest, I haven't even had a chance to follow up on them yet. It just happened a day or a couple of days ago. So uh, I'll be following up on that. But that's another interesting one as well. I know, Peter, in the past, you thought you might be able to do that. But I, I know you're you're pretty busy. Um, so uh, so I, I understand. Uh, yeah that you had to back away from that. But if anyone has a particular interest in that, as you know, you know, Joe is a former architect, that might be something you might be interested in, you know, again, just, just think it over. Um, and uh, but, uh, but I'll keep doing it for the time being. And also uh, just, it's a little bit early, I suppose it's only October, but in, jet, in the beginning of the year, it will be um, the annual renewal or um, uh, re, Reappointment. I'm not sure what the correct, correct word is, but you'll vote for the chair and vice chair again. So, um, if you want, if anyone is thinking about doing that, we can be happy to explain to you what what the duties entail and so far and that sort of thing. If you might be interested, and um, you're welcome to uh, to consider that. Okay, so that's all I have for updates from the chair. What remains is approval of the minutes, I believe it's from September 23rd, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to review those. Is there a motion to approve those? I'll make that motion. Peter. Quick question. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's quite, is that Mark? Is that you? I see your hand up. Yep, yeah, Mr. Chair, any yeah. um, thought about um, going back to a hybrid system for the meetings or are we staying on Zoom for the... Uh, uh, well, I see my current, yeah, we, had, we, I, I see Andy has joined the meeting. I know he, he addressed that, uh, a meeting or two ago. Uh, they're looking at that. Um, I'll summarize my understanding as to where things stand right now. And I'll let him, um, fill in anything I might've missed or gotten wrong. And that's that they're, uh, 
doing some changes to the equipment to try to make a hybrid meeting run more smoothly. I know, uh, I know, for example, Peter, I remember had some some thoughts on that. And a, lot, a number of us are concerned about the difficulty and awkwardness of trying to have a hybrid meeting where some people are present, some are not. Uh, some co public commenters may or may not be present and so on. Um, so I think they're still trying to work out the kinks. So Andy, um, did you want to yeah. say anything about that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, so in, in summary, I think we discussed this maybe at a previous meeting, but the, the status is roughly where we might have last discussed this, which is that there are two things that are issues right now. When we last discussed with the chairs, vice chairs, and members of various boards, um, there were two concerns that were raised about going back in person uh, thus far. There have been attempts to do hybrid meetings or meetings in person, uh, but there are two problems right now that um, don't make it, I think, advisable to try to do that right now. One is the microphones are not working great. Um, we're trying to get more microphones that are consistent with what we are hearing the school committee may have more success with. The council chambers uh, and the equipment they've been using has not been quite as good. So the audio has created some problems for people uh, to be able to hear each other. As the chair mentioned, some people at home, some people in the, the, the room. Um, so in addition to making sure we have a room booked and available to us, um, we have to have audio that's going to work. Keep in mind that there are mask mandates right now. So uh, in addition to not being able to hear each other very well, you're then going to be wearing masks. So you can't hear each other even worse and you won't be able to read each other's lips during the meeting even. So um, that is the reason, those are the two primary reasons why we have not shifted back to a hybrid style meeting. Uh, we're efforting the next week or two to, to obtain the additional equipment and then do a test run of that um, to make sure it's working properly. The question of whether or not you wanna meet knowing that you're still gonna be wearing masks and, um, and that there might be still an issue on that end uh, will be sort of up to you. But we're trying to make sure that the audio is clear uh, and that that is not a problem because it clearly has been to date. And I, to me, it seems a mistake to try to rush back together and not have that working properly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that we're going to be uh, going solely back to in-person meetings going forward. It seems that um, the public you know, has come to expect and I think should come to expect that we're going to maintain um, access for them uh, in this manner. So we're trying to make sure that that hybrid is done seamlessly and smoothly. Um, and there's been varied success as to how that's working. So we're just trying to make sure that we have the right equipment and um, when we brought this concern up to some of the chairs about the fact that you'd be wearing masks and the audio wasn't good, um, the decisions were, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do this until those issues are resolved. Yeah, and it, did I uh, understand you correctly that it sounds like it would, even if they do work out all the kinks, it would be up to the commission to decide if it wants to move to that or not? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, right now we're, we're trying to make sure that all postings and advertisements and so forth account for both options. Um, especially since we don't really know what the future will hold, whether or not we'll be back into some kind of a, you know, remote only type thing. We, do, we just do not know. So what we're trying to do is cover all bases legally, procedurally, um, and then roll back into an in-person, in this case, hybrid, so we can maintain the remote access uh, as needed, uh, particularly for the general public, but um, to, to maintain that going forward. But we're trying to make sure that the uh, situation is set up properly. You're right, though, that the board would have the um, choice then to decide, you know, where to go. Um, we're just trying to make sure that across the board, all boards have the same, um, you know, adequate capacity to right. run these meetings in person. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. And sorry, I didn't see your hand before, Mark. So did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So back to uh, any other co questions or comments before we go to the approval of the minutes, or can I, can we go ahead and make a motion about that? Yes. No, maybe. Is there a motion to approve the draft minutes from the 23rd of September? I make a motion to approve the okay. minutes from the last meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Is that seconded? seconded? This is Joe. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Um, Malcolm, I think you were here last. Yeah. Yeah. Um, except. Yep. Okay. Uh, oops. Sorry. I make a note here. Okay. Uh, Mark and Joe? Yes. Okay. Chris, were you here last? last no, week? I'll abstain. Okay, thank you. I knew somebody was absent. Uh, Peter McNamee. Yes. Okay, Joe Morgan. Yes. Thank you. And it chairs. Yes. Um, that only leaves a motion to adjourn, unless someone has any um, thing they want to add or comment on. If not, you're welcome to make such a motion. So moved. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. Motion's been made. Is that seconded? Second. Okay, I heard two there, but that's fine. Uh, 
I think I heard Mark and maybe somebody else. Um, okay, uh, Malcolm, your vote. Uh, adjourn. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, Mark Sandrone. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Chris. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, not a not a very controversial motion, I know. Uh, Peter. Yes. Okay. Thanks, uh, Joe Morgan. Yes. And I will make it unanimous. So thank you for your time and attention. Appreciate it. And I bid you all have a good evening. And thank you, Chair. Again soon. Good job, as always. <laughs> good night. Okay, thanks very much. Good night. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night, thank you. Good night everybody. Good night. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Yes. Glenn. Yes. Glenn. Yes. Yes. It's Chris. You have yes. like one second. Can I ask you a question? You mean the Preservation Committee? Yeah, can you, uh, uh, Caitlin, can you, can you just me? keep, the, the, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, is of course you can Caitlin, can, no, I can, I can hear you. Yep, Am I I'll not? keep the meeting on, yep. Okay, Go. can you not hear me, uh, Chris? I am speaking. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll Caitlin, uh, I'll, I'll give Chris a call. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. All right, good night. so, Bye -bye. okay, good night.